Bonjour, friends. Bonjour, bonjour, and happy Friday. Happy Friday, friends. How is everyone doing? Welcome to another episode of Je suis beauté, which means I am beauty in English. Get ready for another episode about beauty. We're going to talk about beauty and all things beauty. We have a wonderful guest today. He is a plastic surgeon. He is an expert in the field of beauty. And I so call a friend and tell a friend and get ready to have a wonderful time with us. I hope you all are doing well. There he is. Hi, 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 Shatia. How are you? I am wonderful. How are uh, you? Oh, it's a, a beautiful day out. I had a nice morning swim and this is going to be a great talk. Yes, so I'm, it I'm is. Here. Is. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to be here with us. My pleasure. Thank you. So, my friends, as I said, if you are a woman who appreciates all things beauty, I encourage you to relax. If it's your lunch break, um, share this live, call a friend, tell a friend, because we have some valuable information. Well, we have Dr. Jeffrey Rosenthal here. He is a board certified plastic surgeon. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Plastic Surgery, also former chief of plastic surgery. And among his numerous awards, there are so many, but I'm just gonna highlight just a few. He was honored as America's best physician, also a top physician, and also top doctors of America. So he is an expert. There are so many more, um, but those are what we're going to highlight today. I met him because he was a pageant judge. He serves as a pageant judge as well. And we met uh, because we were both judging queen of the world a couple of months ago in New York. So once again, welcome. Oh, thank you. It was a great, great experience to be a judge with you. Uh, the women had such rewarding histories and they were, they were amazing women for the queen of the world. It yes. was very, very good to be there. It was, a, it, it was a wonderful experience. So Dr. Jeffrey, yes. let's talk about plastic surgery and beauty. Okay. Um, I met with you a couple of days ago in Connecticut. It was a wonderful visit. I learned so much. Oh, I forgot to mention among all these accolades, Dr. Jeffrey is also um, an artist. He's a sculptor as well. So he paints, he molds images, he, he, he creates with his hands, not only on your face, but he creates on, um, he does art, he sculpts, he does all of it. So um, I forgot to mention that as well. You walk into his office and there are paintings everywhere, just beautiful. And I really appreciated that because I just started taking art classes myself. So, and you explained to me, you gave me some, some insights on how to navigate this journey of, of painting. Right. Um, what I like about you uh, when it comes to beauty and art, I love the way you incorporate art sculpting into your practice. Now, are you a plastic surgeon? I know you are a plastic surgeon, but you use your experience in art and sculpting within your practice. Tell us about that. Yes. Well, the, the Greek term plastic surgery comes to mold or change. And I've been doing art since I've been in high school. And as you alluded to, I paint, sculpt, draw, poetry, stone, metal, copper. I've had shows in France all over. But the f highest form of art I can have is when I'm working on a face. And I've limited my practice now to the, the neck and face and hands because it's, it's very visible and it also makes a huge amount of difference in the face itself. So I incorporate my surgical experience, my vast training to be a plastic surgeon all the years I've been doing this. And, and then I bring in my artistic eye and my hands that I can execute what I wish to do. And actually when I'm working on a face, I look at it as a sculpting mechanism because same thing when you're working in wood once you make a cut you can't go back well when i'm putting an injection in or doing something else you have to do it but you have to think way in advance so i plan everything out i never rush when i do anything and when i work on a face i love doing it because i love the smiles i get from my patients but it's like looking at a, a work of art for me okay now i am uh 
an evangelist for natural beauty. <laughs> okay, I'm always talking about natural yep. beauty. My followers know that. Yep. And I promise that today I am going to reveal to them the result of my visit and consultation with you because you did um, work on my face. You stared at me the entire time we were talking. <laughs> you know, as an artist, ladies and gentlemen, he will stare at you and look at your face and just, you know, see what can be enhanced, uh, what can be maintained. So I did have something done. Um, so again, I am an evangelist for natural beauty. I was always afraid of plastic surgery, number one, because I have keloid skin when I get cut. It, it, you know, it bubbles up. So I can't get any cuts or any scars or anything because it's horrible. Um, and you explained that to me as well. You, you, you explained to me the difference between keloids, um, melanated black skin, Caucasian skin, and all the enhancement that, uh, enhancements that are suitable with each. Mm -hmm. Tell us, um, I know you turn away a lot of uh, patient, potential patients as well. Uh, why, who is your ideal client? Well, patients come to me because they know I'm going to take my time, give them the care as if they're part of my family. Everyone gets the same care. Uh, and I'm going to never rush through anything and evaluate their face carefully. If someone comes to me and they're a smoker, they have a, a heavy um, problem with diabetes or other medical issues, and then we have to moderate what we do. And if you're a smoker, I probably won't work on you because each cigarette shrinks down your blood vessels for 12 hours, carries four, at least 40 toxins and destroys wow. your skin. So we don't, we don't do that. But the other part of that is patients have to be realistic about what we're doing. So a good portion of my consultation is to discern what they want, not what I want, and then to try to come up with a plan that looks natural for them. And I, I tell my patients, I can't make you beautiful because if you're not beautiful on the inside, I will never make you beautiful on the outside. Mm. But if you're beautiful on the inside, I can make you even more attractive on the outside. And that's what I do. So we age from the bone out. So the bone is withered away, two layers of fat, muscle, and the skin tends to lose elasticity. So when we approach a face or a neck, we have to decide what areas we want to fill, replace volume, and sculpt. And, and the key here is to always make you look like yourself. It's natural. And the products that I use, Radius, which is a calcium-based product, think of a pillar I'm injecting along the bone, along the jaw to reshape your face. And then I'm using a product called RHA, which is from Switzerland, which is very unique in that it blends into the skin very nicely. And it also has elastic properties. And these are injected all through tiny little pinstick holes. There's no opening. There's no surgery involved here. And so I can rebalance your face, sculpt and refill areas of loss. So, I, love, I love those words. You said you can rebalance yes. and you can sculpt. So you are actually more, well, Let's reveal it today. <laughs> Friends, I know you all have been waiting. Dr. Jeffrey did some sculpting and some contouring on my face, and he's going to tell you why. And the reason why, as a person who is a natural evangelist, mm -hmm. I did it because he said that he only uses natural products. And what he saw with my face, he wasn't going to touch my nose, and he explained why. And I was happy with that. And he said that he wasn't going to touch my neck. And he explained why. He said he was going to touch my cheeks. And he's going to explain what he did to my cheeks, why he did it. But the reason why I went with it is because it was natural. And he sculpted it. He actually sculpted my, my face. So go ahead, doctor, and tell him. Well, tell him what you did. I was fortunate and able to work on someone who's lovely to begin with, who has a good bone structure and, and lovely quality skin. And if you, you have something to work with to begin with, uh, the results are always going to be better. But we have to look at how we age. And we all start out as a, a triangle, the width on top, that's the cheekbones. And as we age, the bone, fat, and muscle are diminished, and the jawline is diminished. And so we go from this configuration to the reverse. 
And so what we want to do is we want to fill the cheek volume, but we don't want to fill it that you look like you have ping pong balls in your cheeks. Often when you look at these movie stars or you're on the inst Instagram, you're, you're seeing patients that are deformed yeah. because they don't understand the underlying anatomy. They don't understand what you have to do in order to create a natural looking face. And that's why it takes me one to three hours to do what I do. It is not a fast procedure. I have to sit you up, lie you down. When I balance it, I have to actually inject you and then I mold it with my hands. And so that's what we're doing. We're rebuilding the cheek area because when you're going from this triangle to an oval, you want to open up the face. And if you open up the face, it's like building a house. You build the foundation first. You don't put the roof on first. So let's, let's build the foundation. Let's build up the walls over here. Your jawline, women lose bone mass because they start out with less. And then you contour and fill around that. Often, if you have a groove in this area below the eyes, injectors will fill that first. Well, you have the groove because the cheek mass has descended. So if we lift this up and re-sculpt this region of the face and give you a nice sweep that takes away a good percentage of this and makes it look natural. The areas are supposed to be harmonious and blend. They're not supposed to be symmetrical. Symmetrical faces don't look beautiful. What looks really attractive is a face that has features that are blending together like yours. And that's what he did. And I am so happy. I was a little nervous. I'm still a little swollen, friends. I'm, it's, 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 the swelling is going down, but this is what it looks like. And I, it, it was all natural. There was no pain at all. Um, it took about two to three hours, like you said. It could have been less if I would have went somewhere else, which I wouldn't have. But <laughs> it was a real process. And what really fascinated me was afterwards, I laid there and you were, you like you massaged, like you were, like if you're making bread and you're molding it and sculpting, that's what you were doing to my, my face. It's like you were reshaping my face. Yes, I, I was molding all the layers, the radius, which was deep down and the hyaluronic acid, which is normally found in our skin. Again, natural products, uh, they don't come from an animal. Calcium is just pure calcium. The hyaluronic acid or, or the RHA products are natural as well and so the body tolerates it well after i inject it through tiny little pinch stick holes i will then mold it to reshape the areas and um, even when i'm doing other procedures such as threads which are also a natural product the pdo threads uh, the products i use are Miracu and mint these are threads with my little barbs on them and again through tiny little pinch sticks i can lift up the cheek tissues and sculpt the underlying tissue and i use that in combination with products so if someone comes to me and they say they just want one thing, we can do that. But optimal results is when we look at the trilogy of how we're going to fill, lift, and stimulate collagen. The end of the lift laser is from Italy, and it's an amazing technology that is developed in Italy, used all over the world. It's, it just came to this area of the country. And in fact, I, I brought it to Connecticut. Oh. I'm probably one of the only plastic surgeons in the area that uses it. And it's a micro fiber that's placed, again, through tiny little pin sticks, um, and I can stimulate the collagen where it's supposed to be stimulated. I can liquefy certain areas along the folds and along the jowl. I can stimulate the neck. And when you combine that with threads and fillers, the results are natural and just outstanding. And again, the endolift is natural, stimulating your collagen. The threads mm -hmm. are natural. They're lifting. They're, they're dissolving away these threads, and they're stimulating your collagen. And the other fillers are all natural. They're just building tissues and stimulating your tissues. So the quality of the skin from everything I do looks so much better after I've finished and it's lifted and supported. Even with a facelift, and I still do facelifts, um, rhinoplasty and eyelid surgery, even after a facelift, if you don't have volume in your face, I can lift you and support and change the shape of your neck muscles, tighten them. But if you've lost volume, I still will have to replace and refill you afterwards. So these products, it sounds like the products that you are using, which really convinced me, these are products that uh, support what's already in your body, yes. what you have already, yeah. and you may have lost over the years, and they stimulate and they help it come back and, and help support your skin. Is that, is that yes. correct? 
that, that's, uh, that's perfectly correct. What these products are doing is they're stimulating your tissues. Uh, the radius is actually replacing lost bone volume. It is just absorbed by the body over 10 months to a year. And the RHA products or the hyaluronic acids are also eventually broken down because the hyaluronic acid in our skin is constantly broken down uh, daily. And so I'm replacing and giving the, the skin an ability to hold up and not droop as fast and you will age at a slower pace. So I'm resetting your thermostat of aging by filling, replacing, and lifting. You're still going to age because that's what we all do. We're, we're designed to age, but we can slow it down and, and we can benefit what you look like. Now, pa patients will come in and they'll say, you know, I feel guilty about this. This is, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. I said, well, you know, you have to think of it. If you take care of yourself, if you exercise, if you wash your face, if you get new clothing, if you like how you feel, this is upkeep. That's all I'm doing is I'm, I'm replacing lost tissue and then we're maintaining your shape and volume. And the key is to maintain your personal identity. I'm not going to make you look like someone else. If you come in with a photograph of a model, I'm not going to make you look like that. I'm going to take your structure and balance it. Same thing when I do noses. You said I tell that. My patients, I tell you my said. patients it's going to look like your nose, just it's going to now fit the other features of your face. That's why noses take me hours to sculpt and you're working through a tiny little cut upside down and backwards to reshape a nose, to balance it. And I've had patients, young women that I've done uh, and, and actually 16 or 17, 19 year olds benefit greatly before they go on to college. And the grandmothers didn't even notice it was different. Because it was it different. So natural. Well, let's talk about noses. Yep. My nose is very, it's, it's, I have a, a very true, typical African mm -hmm. nose, right? Yes. You see it. My nose is like a Michael Jackson nose, <laughs> okay? My nose is not the world's standard of beauty but I've kept it because it's my nose and I embraced it and I love it. We talked about my nose, right? Yes, we did. Why would, why did you tell me you would never operate on a nose like mine and you would not operate on my nose, especially because of my face? So you, you have to look at the shape of the face and the width of the cheeks and the height and, and everything when you're doing a nose and how far apart the eyes are set. And so if you do a nose and you take in the nostrils, you have to make a, a cut and remove tissue from the nostrils to bring it in. If you have a wider face, that's not gonna look very good. Also in black noses or some Asian noses and some uh, Jamaican noses, uh, the septum, which is in between the two nostrils, which is cartilage, is very flat. And in order to build up the top of the nose, like Michael Jackson right. had, he had cartilage taken bone in there that eventually broke down. Uh, you have to put something in there and you don't want to use artificial materials uh, as they do in Asia at some time because they actually break through the nose and, and don't do very well. And so you want to, your nose looks great on your face. If I made right. you a tiny little nose, it, it would not only look unnatural, but it wouldn't look attractive anymore. Exactly. And so, Balancing features is what I need to do, not change your features dramatically, but change something that needs to be altered, but yet still maintains within the realm of your face and the balance between its harmony that I'm trying to do, not symmetry. Right. Well, I, I totally embrace my nose. I mean, I could have changed it a long time ago, but so many black people have a problem. They are pressured by the the standard of beauty when it comes to noses. And my nose is not a part of the standard of beauty. That's why Michael Jackson mm -hmm. and his family members, they changed it. So when I ask you about it, wondering why they look so weird, you explained it to me that it didn't match their face. It, yeah. it, 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 you know, it didn't fit. And you even said that it broke down, right? Yes, yeah, his did break down eventually. Uh, but the standard of beauty has changed around the world because of Instagram and the media. And so having a nose that fits your face is what you should look at. It's not standard of beauty. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a stand, and that's where the artistry that I do comes into play because I can look at minute details of the face and say, you know what, this is not optimal for you. We need to do something else. 
and we have to agree upon it. And how I work, you will come in my office. I'll ask you what bothers you. You'll tell me, and I'll tell you what I can do. And then we have to both agree upon the plan. If I want to do something you don't want to do, we don't do it. If you want me to do something that I don't want to do, I don't do it. And so we have to have realistic expectations and I have to explain to you what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it. And that's why my consultations can take over an hour just to explain it. The second time someone comes in, they jump on the table and say, we trust you, just do what you want to do. Um, and, and it works out for both of us. So now let's talk about the connotation of plastic surgery. When I mentioned to some of my followers, I was talking to a plastic surgeon everyone was like oh no 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 don't change your look don't do this don't do that because the connotation is you know the instagram influencers the models uh, the yeah. celebrities you know they have the extreme yes. plastic surgery and i understand why they do it because they're entertainers entertainers do extreme things but yeah. for the everyday woman right you will not go and have extreme plastic surgery i mean where are you going you're going to go to the supermarket you're going to go to your cubicle or your business with extreme plastic surgery you know it doesn't fit your lifestyle so for everyone who believes that all plastic surgery is what you see on the cell on the celebrities it is not that is not what you do correct well it's not only what i don't do but i think it's also inappropriate for anyone to have extreme cosmetic or plastic surgery. Um, just think of Priscilla Presley, Elvis Presley's uh, wife. She had silicon injected into her face that from my understanding wasn't even medical grade silicon and she developed lumps all over. You look at a lot of the celebrities uh, 15 years ago and they were attractive women and now they look deformed. Their lips are too big. They've made them pucker in like a fish. Yeah. Their, their cheeks are full in the wrong areas. Um, their eyes are pulled. They've had a tight facelift. These are things that are inappropriate for both the patient and I also blame the person that's either injecting you or the surgeon that's doing the surgery, the plastic surgeon, because they have to have uh, enough understanding of balance and symmetry and artistry to say, you're trusting me. And I take my patient's trust extremely seriously. If you trust me, I go to the nth degree to do everything for you. I will call you at night to make sure you're okay. You do. I do everything in my office. I put every thread in, every thread comes out. I do everything. I, I like to be on top of it. And so you have to be able to trust the person that's doing you. Uh, and the, the models and the actresses and actors that have had work done, I, I think some of them is, some of the work is very good. And other times it looks very deforming and does not look appropriate. So you have to investigate who's going to do your work. You have to ask a lot of questions. You have to look at before and after photos uh, of their work. And I, I will show my patients before and after photos and I'm clear about it. Your face will not look like any of these patients. <laughs> you if, did say that. <laughs> if I'm showing you a nose or a facelift or eyelids or fillers or threads, I will say, I want you to look at these, but don't stare at a little piece of it. Stare at the whole picture. And if you like it, I'm for you. If you don't like what it looks like, there's plenty of other people that will make you happy. Doctor, so I'm can. going to get into your business a little bit. I know that you are um, an instructor as well. Yes. Um, and you teach a lot of um, people who own med spas. If, you, if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm fatting myself. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> am I? Am I Making you that hot, speaking about plastic <laughs> surgery, we're just getting your pressure up, right? <laughs> well, I am, I am, I am happy to say I am, I have embraced my menopausal stage as well. So I get hot flashes and my followers know that. So I'm fanning. Um, you also teach, you're an instructor. I enjoy you it. You teach, yeah. right. And you teach the people who own med spas, right? Often, yes. Can you tell us yes. or about that experience? Like, what is that like? Share your thoughts. Well, um, I have a, a, a group of uh, four that we've uh, formed a consortium of people uh, that we, we teach together, but also I go to some of my friends med spas and he will bring in uh, a bunch of um, nurses and doctors from all over the country, even Canada. Uh, and we will show them how to do threads to lift up the face or to do various fillers on the face. And these, these are individuals that have med spas for the most part and are trying to enhance 
uh, their experience and their learning experience. And so I will teach them my particular techniques and I'm clear about it and saying, this is how I do it. These are my techniques that I've learned and taught myself. And you will take what you wish from it. And if you don't want to take something, you will go and do what you've you know, been doing before. But you're here to learn. And I love training and I love teaching and sharing what I can do because I want it to be out there so others can benefit from the knowledge that I've gained and all the experience on the years. So teaching is, is amazing for me. I, I much, very much enjoy it. And that's why my consultations are sort of teaching. Yeah, yeah. I'm teaching you. And when you leave my consultation, most patients have no questions because my object is to tell you everything you're supposed to know. I'm the expert. You're coming to me for that expertise. And when you leave, you have to be comfortable. Often, Patients for the first time, like yourself, will come in and they're nervous. And so I have to understand that, calm them down. And my staff says when they leave, they're just so calm. They're laughing, they're smiling. It's because I, I treat them as a human being and I want them to be comfortable with me. And that's why each step of what I do in my office, I tell them when we're going to do it and I breathe with them and we get through it. And it's usually a very nice experience for both of us. Uh, someone just asked me for before and after photos. I'm going to post that. I'm also going to post the process, every step, everything Dr. Jeffrey did from beginning to end. But for those who are impatient, Dr. Jeffrey, can you tell them some of what you did on sure. with my face? Yes. Um, and also, if they want to see a lot of before and afters, they can go to my Your website. website. Yes. Uh, www.jeffreyrosenthalmd.com. And I have a lot of before and afters. But in your particular face, uh, we were looking at the asymmetries in bone structure. And if you draw a line right down the middle of the face in every single person, the bone structure is different. So one cheek is always higher, uh, one orbit is lower or higher, one eyebrow is higher, and the bone structure is different. So I have to discern which one's higher, which one's lower. And then using that radius product, which is calcium, uh, what we did is I lift up the fat pad here and the muscles and I'm injecting right on top of the bone with tiny, tiny aliquots of the calcium. And then I'm molding it and reshaping it on both sides and I will sit you up. I remarked you again, I drew a map on your face. I will lie you down, inject some more, mold it, sit you up mold it again. And then the second stage is to take a hyaluronic acid product uh, like RHA, which I've been using, and I will inject it to smooth things out. So the, the calcium, think of like a cake and it has to lift up and hold. The cakes aren't smooth, but that's along the bone. So it's lifting up all the uneven fat and tissues above it. So now you take the icing, which is the RHA product, and you smooth it out. And I'm using that with a blunt needle. So I'm sculpting in your cheek and then I'm smoothing and giving you a nice upward sweep. Again, keeping the peak of your cheek over here, which is the peak of the cheek and then balancing the rest of the cheek. Uh, so it looks very natural and widening the upper face in a woman. This should be just slightly bigger than the jawline over here. In men, the jaw can be slightly bigger. So we have to, aesthetics between male and female are totally different. And again, that has to be appreciated when you're doing this. Thank you. And this is what he did. If you take a look, this side is a little, the swelling hasn't, all, hasn't gone down all the way, but it is going. And I love it already. I can't wait. It looks great. It does look lovely. <laughs> so let's talk about beauty. Yes. Tell me about your relationship with beauty. What is beauty to you? Beauty to me, as I said, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of really lovely, warm people that do great things in the world. And, and those people are truly beautiful, no matter what they look like. Um, if you walk around smiling and you're happy, that's a beautiful person. Those that are attractive and they walk around frowning and sad and, and they're nasty, I don't care how lovely you look on the outside, you're just not attractive and beautiful to me. And in fact, the old adage that says, you know, you should not frown because the muscles come down is true. Oh. Because there's two, there's two muscles that are lifting up the corners over here and there's muscles that are pulling down the corners. And if you're frowning, you're making these muscles on top work too hard and they stretch. And mm. we eventually get these muscles stronger and then we have to build up the corners 
or inject some Botox or Zeme into the area so they don't work so hard. So smiling, being kinder really makes a difference. But the attractiveness that I do, or we can call it beauty, is, is again, skin. If you have beautiful skin, and that, that comes from genetics partly, sunblock using a reflective sunblock with zinc and titanium even dark skin requires it because you tan and you can age skin so you need a, a reflective block with zinc or zinc and titanium you need really good skincare products but you don't need a lot of them you need cleansers um, you need some good moisture creams maybe some sea serums retinol i wouldn't use every day especially if your skin is very thin because it makes it thinner uh, but certain products you can get and are some products better than others Yes, but you know, you have to discern which ones you need. You don't need 20 products. You shouldn't have to do that. Diet makes a really big difference. How you eat, if you're eating healthy foods, avocados, healthy proteins, uh, not fast foods, not fried foods, no snacky things that are junky. What you eat is who you are. And so that, and I believe in being calm and meditating. So if you bring your brain, your body, your skin together, that's what makes someone glow. And then I can, again, refill, lift, smooth with different products, or if need be, a facelift, noses, eyelids. If we can't fix the neck with fillers or threads, then you would need a facelift. So who needs a facelift? Someone who comes in with a heavy neck and muscles that are coming down. Those, those muscles, the only way to really tighten them is to do a facelift. But if you have some laxity in your cheeks or jaw, I can fill you dramatically through little pin stick holes and you walk out on your own, very minimal discomfort, and you're back to your lifestyle within a matter of a day or two. This is amazing. You have experience working with burn patients as well, right? Yes, yes. So my, my training after, during plastic surgery, we ran a burn center in Long Island and Bridgeport, Connecticut is the only burn center in Connecticut as well. I did uh, general surgery there where we treated burns. When I came back as a plastic surgeon, I used to do all the head and neck burns and used to rebuild ears and faces. And, and that gave me an understanding of how skin heals, tensions, and I used to do trauma for three hospitals running around putting faces together from car Wait a minute, you said rebuild ears yes. and... Yep, wow. uh, ears that were burnt, significantly burnt. I would, I made up techniques and procedures to salvage cartilage and then rebuild the ears. Same thing with the face. I would graft or rebuild your lips. Uh, and so to do that make, made it easier for me to do cosmetic surgery because I was dealing with the most injured individuals there was. And so when I went into doing cosmetic surgery, I already knew about the muscles, about the nerves, about the balance. And so it combined with my artistic ability, yeah. it made it significantly better for me. But I have to tell you that anytime I do a filler, anytime I do surgery on the face or end of lift or throat, it's difficult. I never finish and I say, wow, that was so easy <laughs> because I'm working so hard. I'm planning every step. I'm thinking about everything that can go wrong to prevent it from you. And I'm trying to make you calm and, and have a result that you smile. And in fact, when I'm often finished, I will stare at the patient again. You alluded to, I stare, I do a lot of you staring. do a lot of staring. <laughs> and then I will sit you back up and I will look again and seeing if I've had everything the way I want it. And my patients are waiting for me to smile. And when I smile, they also say, oh good, now, now we're happy, you're smiling. Now we're happy, yeah. Because yeah, that's what I, I need to do. I need to make it, it's, it's artwork for me. And I never finish it until I'm pleased so I know my patient will what is the most memorable experience you've had in your career with uh, enhancing someone's features or recovering, whether it was a burn victim, whether it was cosmetic surgery, whether it was trauma? Tell us about your most memorable work and the result. Well, you know, I can't say it's one thing. I, I do remember... Uh, a young man who was 17 who was burnt in a party, uh, someone threw gasoline on a barbecue. He was pretty much incinerated and I had to rebuild his ears, his face, his neck, his lips. I put him through many, many operations. I made, I designed things that he could wear so to hold the scars and make him look well. And it, it turned out very well and he was only 17 and I, I really pushed him to do these things. 
Um, and he was great about it, but it was extremely painful. Years later, when he was in his late 20s, um, he invited me to his wedding in Massachusetts. And the best man got up and said, I want to thank Dr. Rosenthal. I almost went under the table. Uh, it, it was um, rewarding, but I was embarrassed. I've had other patients where I've done uh, facelifts and they, they afterwards they will say, you know, I look in the mirror now and I felt young and vibrant. I didn't look like it on the outside. And now I look and feel the same. And I'm so pleased. Noses on young individuals, 16, 17 uh, for women and 17, 18 for men because they age a little slower. The parents have called me and said, you know, our children are socially much more outgoing. My son does better in school. He's not overly conscious about this anymore. And so it, it makes a huge, huge difference psychologically to not worry about something physically if it's correctable. Obviously, if there's something that you want done that is not correctable or you're unrealistic, there's something called body dysmorphic syndrome. And those are individuals that can't recognize when something looks good. And so those are individuals that you have to really not work on and counsel them and, and say, look, this is not appropriate for you because you can never make these individuals happy. But the vast number of patients that I work on in my practice are thrilled. Fillers, they, they walk out and they say, wow, this, I was sunken before. Look, look at how great I look. And it looks so natural now. Or threads, I can put in the office and lift up cheeks and jawline. And afterwards, they say, wow, this is, I didn't need a facelift. Look, look what you did within a few hours through little pinholes. So I enjoy all of these things because I'm really making my patients happy. And in fact, I love creativity. That's why I do what I do as a plastic surgeon. I probably couldn't be any other kind of surgeon because I like to create, I, I like to be making my patients happy and it's, it's visual and by doing it, I'm pleasing them as well as pleasing myself. I think it's changing lives. It does. It, it, it makes a huge difference um, in the individual, both men and females, and, yes. And the confidence factor as well. It, 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 it yes. supports confidence because I can imagine children, even women, I see it all the time on social media, people, um, again, because of the pressures of the world, they haven't embraced who they are. They haven't embraced um, how they show up in the world. For me, you know, thank goodness uh, to my mother from a little girl, she gave me this confidence to embrace who I am. And being a dark skinned woman with very intentionally very short hair and um, a nose that is not the standard of beauty, um, being very, very dark, you know, it takes a lot of confidence. And if it wasn't for my mother, yeah. I would not have had it. But I see so many other women who did, who weren't fortunate enough to grow up with a mother who instilled the confidence. Mm -hmm. And their self-esteem is so low because of their size, because of certain features, because of their skin color, uh, because of their hair. I mean, and, and it's, it's sometimes it's sad to see, um, but it's just that step forward, that helping hand that they need to say, you know, you are okay. There are things that you can do if you wish to. Yes. Right? Yes. This is all voluntary work. It's if you want this, uh, if you've thought about it. Uh, in fact, uh, when I'm doing surgery on a face or eyelids or noses, I will tell them, I would ask them, how long have you been thinking about that? If, if you say, I just woke up today and I want it, I say, you know what? We can have the consultation, but I really want you to go home and contemplate what you're having, why you're doing it, and, and the financial responsibility of it as well. Uh, I want you not to do something if it's going to take money out of your home or your children. You know, you, you need to be stable for this. Uh, and so what you do and give them confidence by doing shows like this is very important because, again, the standard of beauty has changed significantly and having dark skin is, is lovely. And having a wider nose on a face that it appropriate for is perfect. And so there's nothing wrong with different features and different styles of a face. And that's what I have to look at when I'm working on someone. I'm not going to change you into a Caucasian. 
I'm not going to change your Caucasian into a black person. I, I'm going to balance what you have and just replace and fill and rejuvenate. The key is natural rejuvenation. And that's natural what I work, rejuvenation. Natural I love that. Rejuvenation, that's what I work really hard at. And that's why I choose my products myself. I'm always searching for the best products. And I have friends around the country and around the world that uh, are travel and we speak all the time. And that's exactly how I got that endolift from uh, Italy, the endolift laser. I was speaking to my friend in California who just got back from somewhere. He started to use it and he said, I have 10 lasers and this is the best laser because it's under the skin, not external. And you're not burning the skin. And I can redo it. I said, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and so um, we're, we, I go to meetings and I speak with all these individuals that are very well educated and dedicated to do a great job. And, and we consult and we listen and we learn from each other. And, and that's why I teach because I, I like to bring what I've learned and what my friends have taught me, you know, what I do has been a, a, a stepping. People have taught me things and then I've changed it, but I, I don't reinvent everything. I've taken what they do and I may alter it and then I may add to it, but we have to communicate and communication is something that's really lacking in this world. Being able to really speak to someone and have them listen, not just hear. And right. if you learn to listen, you will do much better. And you learn to articulate well and not just say things. And the combination will make our world much, much better. Much better. Speaking about standards of beauty, I remember from reading old textbooks, um, I love old royalty. I love um, mm. anything that has to do with uh, royalty from hundreds of years ago. And I remember the standard of beauty was when you look at portraits of Venus, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm, I'm into that as well. When you look at portraits of Venus, Venus was not a small woman. No. Ven <laughs> Venus was a big woman. She had a belly. She had cellulite. She had everything. That was beautiful. Yes. Mona Lisa was beautiful. Yes. Today, you look at the old portraits of Venus, and you look at the Mona Lisa, and you're like, that's beauty? And today, the standard of beauty for a woman's body is completely different. I mean, it's, 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 it's much, much smaller. Mm -hmm. So you have women literally starving themselves to be thin, right? Because that's the standard of beauty. Um, I will say in the Black community, uh, there's this trend called the BBL, mm. and all the girls have the same body. Right. It, it's, it's ridiculous, and everyone is just jumping on the bandwagon of what the current standard of beauty is. Even in the beauty pageant world, all the women look alike. Mm -hmm. No one is unique. Right. Well, there are some who are unique, but very few are unique. So standards of beauty, um, what is one trend that you see if you are aware of it in the plastic surgery industry today that just makes you like, like, oh my God, what is this? Well, if you look at mannequins, strangely enough, over the years, you will see how the standard of beauty has changed. So they used to be a little wider, more voluptuous, then they got thinner during the twiggy stage. Now they're more muscular and wider. Yeah. So the mannequins themselves will tell you how our society has changed views. Uh, I think it's really wrong for a young woman, young girl, to have a, an image that she's too fat when she needs to grow. She needs to have the energy to build her muscle, to make good strong bones, and to be emaciated uh, I think, or bulimic is, is really wrong in our society. And it has to do with Instagram and social media where everyone is bullying someone else because they look a little different. Uh, and again, that's, that has to do with upbringing. I mean, you had a great opportunity to have parents that would you know, educate you and show you the right way to do things. And when I used to do a lot of trauma, um, I don't do it any longer, but I used to do a lot of children that were injured and I could tell you within 10 seconds whether the parent was good or not. Wow. Parent came in, parent came in and they were crying and all upset and it was a small little cut. Um, I would have to pull the mother or father aside and say, look, 
Um, you, your child is looking for you for support and guidance. And if you show you're upset, I will not be able to do this. And I'd say you'd have to wait outside and I would spend an hour or two with this child speaking to the child and saying it's not gonna hurt. I often put the child to sleep. The mother would, I think they became bored with my voice because they kept saying it wasn't gonna hurt. Um, <laughs> the mother would come in and say, how'd you do that? Would you like be our babysitter? So um, again, standards of beauty um, have to do with our society pressures. And it's nice to be an individual. It's nice to have enough confidence to say, you know what, I don't have to look exactly like this person. And, and speaking about the fat implant into the butt. Yeah, the we BBL. Had, we had discussed that briefly when you were here. That happens to be one of the most dangerous, complicated surgery procedures because the fat, if it's not injected correctly, and if it's injected too low into the muscle, can get into the blood vessels and go to the heart or lungs more likely, and cause all kinds of complications. So out of the cosmetic surgical procedures, that has one of the highest complication rates. And so you have to be very careful who's doing it and what their expertise is. Now there are other products besides fat that we can inject. The radius can be made very dilute and it can be injected to stimulate collagen. Uh, some people use sculpture, which is another product to build up collagen. But those are pretty much under the skin itself and not all the way into the muscle. And so they're not gonna cause a big blood clot or a problem breathing. So right. again, you have to be very careful with what you're doing. Well, Dr. Jeffrey, I thank you so much for taking out this time from your day and your clients. My um, somebody just said, wow, they should not do it. It can be dangerous. Oh, yes. Yes. Lots, a lot of these procedures are very, very dangerous. So is there anything else you would like to share with my followers? I have people from all around the world. I have people from Brazil, Colombia, the Netherlands, all over the world. What would you like to say? Well, you know, there, there are good doctors and injectors everywhere in the world. You just have to be very cognizant of their experience. You have to discern from their website or ask them what they do. And, and they should be able to tell you the risks, the complications, and the rewards. If, if you go into any injector, any plastic surgeon, they say, this is easy. Let's just do it. You trust me. If I were that person, I would get up and walk out because there's nothing that can't potentially have risks. But what I'm here to do is to prevent those risks and to make them as best or easy as possible. And you also have to understand that if you do have a complication, if something doesn't heal well or potentially gets infected, which is very rare, I'm here to take care of you. And so, you know, having surgery around the world, many people are flying around the world to have surgeries. Well, that's all great because they're great surgeons, but what happens if you have a complication? Who's going to take care of you? Who's going to monitor you if you come back here and you have a problem? So money is important in life. I'm not, not saying it isn't, but you can't return your face. You can return a vacuum. You can go to Amazon and bring something back. But if you have the wrong filler, if you have the wrong threads, the wrong end of lift, you burn something. If you have fillers that make you look lumpy, very difficult to correct. It's also important not to overdo it on the first treatment. If you're coming in for fillers, uh, I'd rather underfill you and bring you back in a few weeks and put more in or do a procedure and then let's do threads and you know what, we'll see you in six weeks and perhaps do some fillers or end a lift, do it and then slowly build you up with other products. So doing it slowly, doing it meticulously, carefully and taking you into consideration, not my pocketbook, but you is what you really need to look after. That's really critical. Dr. Jeffrey, what is your website? 